progress we've made. <clears throat> Our women's basketball is outstanding. <clears throat> Excuse me, we had three NCAA tournament teams and our conference tournament runner-up, USF, reached the second round of the NCAA tournament. Jose Fernandez has done a remarkable job with that program and he reached the 250 win milestone last season. I want to recognize Lisa Stockton of Tulane who won her 500th game last season. Congratulations on this wonderful accomplishment. Matilda Mossman of Tulsa and Heather Macy of East Carolina each had their 200th career win last season as well. These are quite the milestones. We have an excellent group of teams and obviously a very excellent group of coaches as well and our future is very bright. Our women's tournament at Mohegan Sun has been extremely successful. I would argue that it is the most successful of any women's tournament in the country. Uh, we uh, will plan on having it there again this year and we have a year after that if we want to stay. So we recently renewed our deal there. Everyone enjoys the arena and the setting and we thank the Mohegan management for their support of our tournament. Before talking about our women's basketball achievements and the prospects for this season, I want to thank and recognize Barb Jacobs for her outstanding and tireless work as our Associate Commissioner of Women's Basketball. No one has a better grasp of the game and the challenges we need to face than Barb. She's a great advocate for our conference, but also for the game of women's basketball. And she also was a distinguished coach, as you know, and, and had over 300 wins herself. Uh, Siobhan Mansfield and Chuck Sullivan are handling our women's basketball communications with great skill and enthusiasm. You all know them. Debbie Williamson does a great job overseeing our women's officiating. And our digital team, led by Mark Hodgkin, uh, will do uh, a great job covering this event and covering the entire season. The national championship trophy that we have on display here, and obviously we're all very proud of that, uh, speaks for itself. But our league as a whole has accomplished a great deal. As I mentioned, we had three tournament teams, UConn, USF, and Tulane, three NIT teams, Temple, Tulsa, and East Carolina. And I please, I apologize, I've had allergies and uh, they were really, uh, I never had them before, but I guess you can get them at any age. In any event, uh, we had National Player of the Year, Brianna Stewart. She was not able to be here today. Uh, we had five All-Americans, and as our, I mentioned, uh, we have exceptional coaches. Ten have regular season or conference tournament championships on their resumes. We were excited about the 2015-16 season. We have more competitive balance in the league than we've had before. And as, as I said, we have terrific players across the board. Our student athletes are outstanding as well. They do a great job on the court and in the classroom. The upcoming season promises us unprecedented success for this conference. We also will have expanded media coverage, which is very important to building our, our women's basketball brand. Uh, and it, this will obviously continue. In addition to the great exposure we receive on ESPN and CBS Sports Network, we have an outstanding lineup of 25 games that will be televised on the American Digital Network. We also plan a challenging non-conference schedule which increases interest in our teams and also increases media interest. Some of our top non-conference games include UConn at Ohio State as part of ESPN's tip-off marathon, USF at Louisville on ESPN2, UConn versus Notre Dame on ESPN, Cincinnati versus Ohio State on CBS Sports Network, USF versus Penn State on CBS Sports Network, and UCF and USF in the American SEC Challenge. In the past, I've talked about our reinvented conference and the progress we've made. I don't have to spend much time on that anymore. We're strong and stable. We're achieving great success in all of our sports, and all of our sports lend themselves to helping all our other sports. Our women's basketball is a national gem, and it will continue to bring attention and accolades to our league. And in closing, I do want to stress how important academic achievement and sportsmanship are in our conference. As I said, we have outstanding student athletes. You'll, you'll meet them here today and you'll meet their coaches as well. We play at a high level, but the student part of that comes first. Our academic mission is paramount and our athletic success flows from that. We also play with class and sportsmanship. I'm very proud about how our student athletes compete. And I don't think anyone better summed up my philosophy on that, which I know you all share, than, than the late, great Yogi Berra. We have a lot of fun with Yogi's famous malapropisms and humorous quotes, but he was also a man of simple wisdom. He once said something that applies to our enterprise. 
he said, I tell the kids, somebody's got to win, somebody's got to lose. Just don't fight against it. Just try to get better. That's what we're trying to do, and we are getting better. We're an excellent conference. We stand for all the right things. Our women's basketball is one of the shining lights, and we're really proud of it. We salute our opponents. We make friends within and outside the conference, and we will continue to do that. I look forward with great enthusiasm to the season. I'll be at some games, and I wish all of our teams well. And thank you, and have a great session today. I know you'll enjoy meeting everyone and, and dealing with uh, the media who have been kind enough to come, and we thank the media for the great coverage they give our conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. So, before we take a look ahead at the upcoming season, let's look back with some highlights of the Athletic American Conference. All right, great highlights, looking back, and a lot to look forward to. So we're gonna have some fun today, as we did last season, uh, showcasing our coaches and our players and showing you some of their personalities, but also giving you their thoughts on what's going on right now in women's basketball. So, because we are moving to a four quarter or four period system this year, we decided to do the format very similar to that here at Media Day, so we're gonna have four quarters where we'll have student athletes and coaches come up on stage and join us. We'll have 10 minutes for the student athlete group, 15 for the coaches because coaches get long winded uh, and we'll have them share their thoughts. I thought one of the best parts of this experience last season was that our coaches were able to establish themselves as thought leaders in women's basketball. I can't tell you the number of people I had asked me for the link to the experience we had last year. Can we go back and watch it and what kind of things were shared? Uh, because they just thought it was awesome that you guys were willing to give your opinion on some things going on in our game. So, I want to first introduce Leticia Sims, who's going to assist in bringing up our student athletes today. And she is going to bring up our first group, introduce them by name. We want you to come up and join us on stage. And Leticia, do you want to share maybe with the group kind of what your aspirations are? Okay. Um, thanks, Latina. Um, why aspirations? Yeah. I was on spot. Um, <laughs> See, in this job, you gotta be, <laughs> gotta be quick. Um, I'm actually a student athlete at the University of South Florida. I run track and field. This is my senior year. I'm going to graduate in May. <laughs> um, I have a lot of aspirations. Um, I wanna make it to the Olympics. <laughs> I wanna, and I also wanna be a sports reporter like LaChina. So I'm learning right now. I'm watching her. This is my dream job, so yeah. And I wanna thank Siobhan for allowing me to be here and just doing some extra work out of, outside of track and field and getting into the field of sports broadcasting. That was awesome for your debut. Great <laughs> job. I did put her on the spot. Thank you. And this is just one example of how our student athletes then go on to have other careers, maybe in television one day, or she said, first of all, she wants to go to the Olympics. So we'll, we'll okay. leave her with the athlete side first. <laughs> so I'll now turn it over to Leticia. We'll have our first group of student athletes come and join us. All right, and for our first quarter, I'm going to announce the six lovely ladies on the back wall right here. The first um, 
Student athlete, I will announce is University of South Florida, Aaliyah Gregory, to the stage. You see, yeah. I mean, to the, huh? Yeah. To the floor, sorry. <laughs> and then the next, um, University of Cincinnati, Miss Alicia Lovett. <laughs> University of U um, Connecticut, Morgan Tuck. Eastern Carolina University, Jada Payne. Palm, um, Jada Payne, yeah. University of Houston, Jessica Palmer. In Memphis, Ariel Hearn. All right, so we have our first group up here. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. And let's start with UCF. So this is sort of like the home team, I would say. Um, Aaliyah, sophomore, last season, second leading scorer as a freshman on your team. Now with another very young team returning, eight of 12 are underclassmen. You've made a successful transition from high school, doing well last season in your freshman year. If you were to give advice to someone in your position who is looking to make a splash in their freshman year, what was the key to your success last season? Um, the key is just being willing to learn. Um, they're going to throw a lot at you, and it's going to be hard trying to gain everything. But just try and learn everything, be a sponge, absorb it, soak it all in. And overall, just work hard. No matter what they tell you to do, go hard doing it, and you'll be all right. And what kind of things did you maybe work on in the off season that we may see new in your arsenal this year? Um, being more comfortable at the point guard position, being able to kind of control my team, control the tempo of the game. Um, handling the ball a little bit better, handling pressure, and making my outside shooting a little bit more consistent. Awesome, well done, round of applause. <laughs> and next we have Alicia Lovett, who this time last year you were named preseason all-conference, but unfortunately you missed the year with a season-ending injury. Now you had the opportunity to watch the game from another angle, um, watching your team participate. What did you learn about the game from the sideline? What did you learn about Alicia during that time? Um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about my teammates in general and the things that they like to do and they don't like to do, so I can help them with that. And I learned that, you know, I'm actually a warrior because, I mean, most people who would have hurt themselves would have kind of probably would have been in themselves and kind of just sad about it. And I just quickly turned from, you know, thinking about my season and it's being done my senior year to just being a leader and being what I needed to be for my team whenever they need it. And if you had some advice for someone who may find themselves in a similar situation with injury, as this does happen as a part of sport, what, would, what advice would you give them to overcoming the way you did? Um, I would tell them to just think of it in a way that, you know, anything can happen. Uh, basketball could be over in like that. And just to be strong and just know that, you know, push yourself through everything that you have to do to get back if that's what you really want to do. Thank you so much, and congratulations. We look forward to seeing you back on the court. Thank you. And next we have Morgan Tuck, ViewCon. And speaking of injuries, your, the beginning of your career was riddled with injuries, but you bounced back pretty beautifully last season. You were named first team all-conference, and obviously your team winning the national championship. Now you have a very unique skill that I am I am very um, envious of because I'll tell you, my field goal percentage was not very good um, when I was in college, but you led the league in field goal percentage and were amongst the best in the nation last year. What is the key to that high level of efficiency and what do you look for when you're making a decision to take shots? Um, I would guess just taking your time. You know, I think that's something I try to do is when I get the ball, not rush. Um, and I'm around the basket, so I think that helps my field goal percentage. Um, but I think, you know, just trying to take my time when I have the ball and, you know, making sure that I take the right shots. Now, obviously, UConn is the heavy favorite to repeat um, as national champions. How do you and your team deal with the expectation from the outside for your program? Um, I think, you know, we deal with it by just trying to work hard. I mean, we know what it takes to get to that level and to win the championship. So we just try to focus on the moment and, you know, making sure each practice we're getting better and not thinking about, you know, what could happen in March and April, but thinking about what's happening now. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Morgan Tuck. And then I'm looking at the shirt there. Is that East Carolina we have? Jada Payne? Hey, Jada. So you obviously have had a very successful career thus far. You have the chance to reach the 2,000 point mark in your career this season and taking East Carolina along with you. You have a particular skill as well, much like Morgan, as you led the league in free throw percentage last year. Tell us about how you developed your free throw technique over time. And, and you know, we all, I know I had some particular things. I tried to be like Patrick Ewing, so some of my different free throw, you know, some of that comes from him and watching other players. But how did you develop what you do on the free throw line? Um, well, it's really all about consistency and uh, your routine when you shoot the ball. Um, it was funny because when I was a freshman, you know, I kind of shot really fast and I just, you know, put it up and it would go in, but my coach would constantly yell at me and say, um, you need to be more disciplined in how you shoot, you know, and I kind of didn't understand it. But um, as the years went on, um, I developed a routine that I stuck with and um, I practice it every day. And it's just all about repetition and getting reps in. Now you will have some teammates joining you this year who sat out last season. As you made that, tradition, that transition, having to sit out and then playing, what are some things that you learned in that time watching the game that maybe you can share with them as they get ready to go? Um, well, I think they used that year to really learn our system and get a feel of um, how we play as a team and how we work together. And um, I really took away from my red shirt year uh, some of the kind of the strategy that goes into the game and to think on multiple levels of the game. And um, you can kind of see it now in practice how they've developed, even though they uh, didn't get to play last year. So um, I'm really excited about what, they, what they're going to do this year. Thank you so much. Great job, Jada. And next we have Jessica Palmer, who has a birthday coming up, right? October 29th. What are you gonna be, 22? Yes, ma'am. Man, living the life. Those are the best years. Were you, any big plans? Mm, no, not really. I have practice. So. <laughs> you just don't wanna tell coach what you're planning on doing. I know how that works for sure. Well, you're the team's leading score, leading returning score from last season. And you guys have a new facility, $25 million facility for men's and women's basketball. And I know you're excited about that opening. From a student athlete, perspective. What do facilities like that do to enhance your experience? Um, I think it's a great benefit for our program just being able to have a place that we can call our own and have access to a court 24-7 whenever we need to get extra work in and I think it's great for us not only on the basketball side but academic as well because it's filled with study rooms and things like that so we can focus in so we can become um, better student athletes all around. We always like to hear that, better student athletes all around. They should have you on a little commercial or something, actually. That was pretty good. So nowhere to go but up for your team, a challenging season last year. What may surprise people when they see your team this year? Um, our newcomers. I think our newcomers have came in, and they've really tried to change the culture of the program. And the, uh, We've all brought it, bought in into the coach, uh, into coaches' program, so we're ready to go and we're excited to go and I think this is the most competitive team that I've played with in my four years. That's awesome. That's what we love to hear. Well, thank you so much. Great job, Jessica. And Ariel Hearn, who was second team all-conference last season representing Memphis. Now, something that we're talking a lot about in college athletics is cost of attendance and as sort of a way to be proactive, I believe your coaching staff bought in some financial advisors to talk to your team about saving money and some best practices. What are some things that you learned um, about your finances or taking care of money that you think will help you in the future? Um, when we had this little financial, I'm gonna call it a class because we were in there um, learning and studying, going over notes and everything. Um, one thing the guy taught us was um, to save money every week. Um, he taught us that college basketball would come to an end and we were going to have to get a real job. Um, especially just being fresh out of college, uh, you won't probably get the job that you desire. So saving money is very important. Um, we talked about saving um, a dollar a day for 52 weeks. So at the end of a year, you should have possibly $1,300. So he really benefited us and he really taught us to save money. And I think a lot of our teammates um, took it and we were all saving money. I might need to sit in on that class. Coach, can I get in on Are they still offering? Okay, I may have to come in and sit. That's very good information. So in terms of this season for your team, what do you want to leave as, as someone that's a local 
who is right there in Memphis. What kind of legacy do you want to leave at the end of this season? Um, I do want to be a legend leaving out of Memphis. Um, this year, me and my coach have been talking about being a better leader. Um, I think that's my biggest goal as far as me being a senior. I want to be a better leader on and off the court for my teammates. I want to leave um, with them knowing something that's positive about me, something that I can you know, teach them and they can carry on throughout the rest of their college career. Well, that is the end of our first quarter. Give a hand to the first group. Job well done, ladies. You can take your seats. Well, they have raised the bar for everyone that is yet to come. And now Leticia will introduce our next group. All righty. And we have University of Central Florida. I called it the rivalry school last time. Um, Miss Joy Williams, University of Cincinnati, Jamel Elliott, Yukon, Gino Ariema, East Carolina, Heather Macy, Houston, Ronald, Huey, and Memphis, Melissa McFerrin. Welcome coaches, welcome coaches. All right, now your student athletes did a great job, so you're gonna have to uh, carry the torch from here on out. Let's start with Joy, since you are here. Now, what we did for our coaches was we assembled a group of hot topics. So what's going on in basketball? What will be going on in basketball? And we want to get your thoughts on it. So Joy, starting with you, you have vast international experience with USA Basketball as both a coach and a committee member. Um, as we look to move towards more of an international model with our rules here, what do you see as the advantages of that for our game when we are in international play? Well, I, I think being a part of USA Basketball, one thing that I really loved about it was the flow of the game. I thought it was spectacular. And when I got back and you look at our game, we have so many stoppages and the game doesn't flow as well as it does there, I, in my opinion. And, you know, so I, I love the changes. I love the uh, four quarters, um, you know, Less timeouts is something that we had to get used to with international play. And I think, you know, a lot of coaches are like, no, 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 we need them. But it actually went pretty well. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. I'd love to see the game be uniform all across the country, um, all across the nation, basketball being uniform. So I think we're moving in that direction. And just quick follow up for you in terms of those timeouts. Um, as a coach, how do you start to strategize maximizing fewer opportunities to take breaks? Wow, that's something that we're discussing right now. And then we just learned the length of the timeouts is going to be a year. So um, <laughs> we're going to have a lot of things to discuss in the two minutes and 45 second medias. But um, I think it'll be challenging at some points. Obviously, uh, teams have to learn how to play through things. You can't rescue um, your team, so to speak, with timeouts because you need to save them to be able to advance the ball at the end. So I think there's a lot of different strategies that'll go into play and we haven't come up with all of them yet, but I'm sure as we go and before we get into conference play, we'll be, um, have some things figured out. Thank you, Coach. That's Joy Williams. Appreciate that. <laughs> Jamel Elliott, sticking with the rule changes. So there are four quarters, but there are also some changes to the backcourt rules. There's no more one and ones I mean, we're going through a lot. How do you get your student athletes or I guess, how are you transitioning your student athletes right now as we look ahead to what's to come this season? Um, I think we uh, put them in a lot of game situations in practice. Um, you know, a lot of timeouts, advancing the ball, um, simulating the last minute of the games, um, letting them know that in the first half, if somebody calls a timeout, um, you know, you can go a long time without getting a rest and trying to simulate that in practice. And, uh, you know, really, really giving them the rules. We gave them to them electronically. We verbally told them about them. We tried to show them on film. So, and, and kids learn differently. And so we tried to uh, approach it by giving them every single um, scenario possible and uh, put them in those situations and so that when the game comes, they'll be prepared, will be prepared. Um, and it's gonna be a process, you know, it's gonna be a process for the coaches and the players to get used to. Um, but I'm very, very uh, 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 in favor of them and looking forward to uh, coaching with the new rules and how it's gonna affect our game in a positive, in a positive way as far as the flow, the time, and uh, the overall aspect of uh, the product on the floor. Thank you so much, Coach. You're Great. Welcome. Thank you. 
Gina, a little bigger concept here I want to ask you about. We're hearing the term small ball quite a bit. You watch the NBA championship, you know, the Warriors won because they went small, some people would say. But then you fast forward to the WNBA finals when the MVP is Sylvia Fowles, who is a traditional back to the basket center. What do you think small ball, where is its place in the evolution of the game right now? Well, I think it's always been there. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are, there's a lot of instances where if you look back at some of the best teams, uh, they all share a certain characteristic and they all, they all have really good guards. Um, you know, when, <clears throat> when you think about it, the ball is the most important thing in, in, in the game and um, having the most players on the floor that can handle the ball and pass it, dribble it, catch it and shoot it, you probably give yourself the best chance to win. And, um, you know, Minnesota won before they had Sylvia. They won without a center and they won with a center. And it might have to do with the three guards that they have on their team that are really good. So I, I think the, 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 the guard situation is, is I think one of the best things about women's basketball is that you're not, uh, not always able to rely on, you know, a six, seven or, you know, or a big center. They don't exist anymore anyway. There's not that many of them out there. So you're going to find more and more teams, I think, playing with five or at least four guard type players. And that's going to make the game, I think, a lot more, more exciting and more fun to watch. Quick follow-up for you going back to some of the rule changes. Um, I have a feeling that everyone will have to be patient this year in the transition for women's basketball, college women's basketball. Where do you think um, we will see that, where will it take time for us to really see the results of the decisions that are made this year? It, it, it depends, the China. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm anxious to see how, uh, how the coaches and the players respond to it. Um, I think the games are, uh, and, and you hate to say this, but I think that the games are um, a lot of times controlled by the officiating. I don't mean that the officials win and lose games. I, I, don't, I don't believe that at all. I don't, I don't think they have that effect on games. But I think that the, the amount of calls, when they come, how, how frequent, the, the, the foul situation is in the whistles. I think that has an effect on the game, the quality of play, the, the style that, that, that the game takes on. So I think our officiating, and it's not the official's fault, don't get me wrong, I think our rules have got to be enforced. They, they, whatever rules we come up with, we as coaches have got to buy into them. We've got to coach our players according to the rules, and then the officials have to enforce the rules. And the players then will get accustomed to playing under those rules. And in the beginning, it's not going to be very pleasant to watch because players, by their nature, every one of them in here, love the foul. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. They live the foul. So the more we can eliminate that, I think the better team we're going to be. Thank you so much, Coach. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Heather, East Carolina. Um, your Pirates were 11-7 and seven in conference play last year, so a lot of success coming in. As you look hindsight, what kind of changes did you have to make coming into the American Athletic Conference, um, and, and how did it change your program overall? Yeah. Well, first, all the student athletes that were just up here, you guys did great. They were great. Because, you know, that's a hard thing to do. I don't know how much we – I don't know, coaches, y'all were up here. I don't know how many of y'all like to get in front of the – cameras and all that kind of stuff, but y'all did super, and I thought good representations of all your programs. So I was really impressed. Uh, so we've got some incredible student athletes in the American Conference, that's for sure, but um, at ECU and as we progressed, and we kind of went into two different leagues. As we left Conference USA, there was all of a sudden a brand new looking Conference USA with new teams and new cities to go to, and we were kind of left in that middle ground, uh, but from a recruiting standpoint, it was great for us because it enabled us to revamp a little bit to make the transition into the American. Uh, I was pleased with our first year, new competition, um, played some people that we had, we had traveled to Memphis and we had traveled to Tulane 
Um, so that was nice for us, but we got to go some new places where we had not been and going up to Temple or going on over to, to Cincinnati. So um, the American Conference is a great league, and um, we were pleased with our first year. Nowhere close to where we're wanting to go or what the goals are, but I thought for the first step it was an incredible time. And the, the good and the, the tough part for us is we just graduated six seniors a year ago that helped us through that transition. Uh, over the next course of the next two years, we will, we will have graduated 12. So some kids who have the upperclassmen leadership has really helped us through our transition. Uh, then some young ones are going to have to pick up uh, really quickly as we progress forward. Thank you so much, Heather. We'll be looking forward to watching ECU this year. Your hand. Coach Huey. How are you? I'm fabulous. How are you? I'm fabulous. I would be doing better if I had a $25 million facility uh, being built in my <laughs> neighborhood. So congratulations on that. Thank now you. Now we're going to talk a little bit about social media. And before I continue, I think we have some social media taking place here. Now everyone, get out your phone. And we want you to take a quick selfie. I have a selfie mirror here that I'm going to take with the coaches. And we're going to tweet. I know, isn't this cute? Oh, wait a minute. Where's my screen? Is this? So we want every, it is, it's a little mirror and it's a selfie. So just, do I just touch the button? Yep. Cool, so coaches lean in. Oh, you're gonna have to way lean in. Wait a minute, hold on, let's see here. We're gonna have to. Jump in your selfie. Oh my goodness. I can barely see you, but that's okay. I can see me and that's all that matters. Ready? <laughs> on three, one, two, three. I think this up. Uh, there it is. All right, we'll see how that turns out. We want you to tweet your selfies. You see the handle there via Twitter, and now they have Snapchat, and they've got all of these things with social media. So, Coach Huey, where are the boundaries, or where should the boundaries be in social media? I mean, how much is too much access? And we're talking about if you're recruiting a high school athlete for your own team, perhaps. Um, what, is, what are the good and bad of social media right now? I think it lies in your own judgment. Um, for us, we love to give a snapshot of our program, our players, um, our staff, everybody. Um, from me dancing on stage um, to challenging Jessica in the dancing contest to anybody coming to watch practice and seeing something that they like and being able to tweet about it to uh, I don't do the Snapchat. That's the one thing I haven't joined yet, and um, the girls will come by and show me some of those things. And uh, I think it's it's a great idea to give people insight of your program. And I think it's up to you how far you want to go with it and, and use those things to promote your program because it's a wonderful tool. And I ask that question because that's a discussion we have a lot, especially in women's basketball, because we want more exposure. And social media is a place where I know I've found a lot of women's basketball fans gather, especially on Twitter. And you kind of feel like there is, a, you know, this huge group and this huge following, whether it is big or not. Um, so it's, it's how much of that is good. And then you also have to think about protecting your players. You know, with the quarter system now, there's some discussion about doing interviews uh, with coaches in between quarters. So not sure how you guys would feel about that, but that's something that could also go viral. So those are some of the ongoing discussions that we're having. Thank you so much for your thoughts on that, yes, um, Coach Huey. <laughs> now, Melissa, we kind of put um, Ariel on the spot a little bit about the finances. The cost of attendance is changing the landscape of college athletics. How does that impact recruiting in the American Athletic Conference? Well, first of all, let me just say that the, the cost of attendance in general, I think, is, is a very positive thing used in, the, in a proper way. I think what we're going to see is that student athletes, um, although we all feared that student athletes might go to the highest bidder, I don't think there's an, enough difference that that's really going to be the case. I think it becomes a benefit for them once they decide where they're going to school. And I don't know that any decisions are truly made on the actual number. Um, but as, as we look at cost of attendance, one of the things that we're trying to do is just being very good stewards of the additional funds that are being provided to our student athletes. Obviously, we've talked about this at length with, with our own students, um, to use it for something that can truly be life changing rather than, as I said even a year ago, um, the latest pair of Jordans. You know, that's not the purpose. We want to be good stewards of 
that money that comes to us from our institutions or from our donors and things of that sort. But there's no question also that the American Athletic Conference is, is one of those conferences that is truly able to provide that to our student athletes. Um, and it's a wonderful incentive. Maybe there's a separation point for those conferences that truly do and for those that don't. Um, but we're dealing with that all across the country, not just with cost of attendance. Well said. Melissa McFerrin, thank you so much. And thank you to our coaches. That is the second quarter. Thank you so much, coaches. And Siobhan, how am I doing on time? Making sure um, she's in here somewhere. I'm good. All right. All right. So, coaches, you can head back to your seats. Look, Gino's trying to get you up and moving. Your turn's up. And Leticia's going to take us to our group of student athletes. All right. And we are in the third quarter now. And I'm going to announce the, the um, next student athletes, USF, Miss Courtney Williams. SMU, Alicia Froling, Temple, Fayanda Fitzgerald, Tulane, Leslie Vorpal, and Tulsa, Kelsey Grovey. Doesn't matter, you can sit wherever you want, actually. As long as you guys are friendly and passing the microphone, that's the, that's the part. <laughs> Oh, maybe they, do you want them to, you want to put them in, okay, maybe you are going to be in order. Sorry. That's me trying to take over and I'm clearly not in charge. Um, all right, so we are into our third quarter. Halftime was pretty quick, wasn't it? This is how the games are going to move this year, so y'all better get ready, okay? The timing of this moved pretty quickly. So, Courtney. Hey there. How are you? I'm all right, how are you doing? exciting summer for you coming off a huge season um, for your program arguably the best in program history with top 25 rankings um, 27 wins in a season winning NCAA tournament game uh, but you went on to participate in USA basketball share with us that experience and what you learned that may help you in the upcoming season uh, I think I learned how to be a role player when <laughs> We don't, go, we don't want you to learn too much of that, right, Jose? <laughs> you know? I mean, it was a good thing. It was humbling because it's like I'm, you're, so, you're so used to being that score. So then you get around all these other great players and you kind of, it's, it's kind of like, okay, I got to take a step back and just do what the team need me to do. So I think that was the biggest thing that I learned that sometimes I'm not going to always just be that score. I have to learn how to impact the game in other ways. And that could be big for you, especially as you are projected to be a first round draft pick to the WNBA. Your team also took an international trip this summer. What was that experience like and what may help you or your team from a bond, team bonding standpoint that will carry on into the season? Oh yeah, it was amazing. I think we got a, a jump start on playing together. I think it, it's kind of it giving us an advantage in a sense because Whereas people started their first practice, we kind of felt like it was practice number 15 because we had already played so many games in practice. So I think it was definitely a great experience for our team. Well, very valuable. What was the best part of that trip? What did you like? What was your best favorite place to visit? Uh, you were in Spain, anywhere? I mean, it was, I think just being with my teammates. Uh, going from being in South Korea and kind of having to adapt and be around people that I wasn't used to, to go to Spain and being with people that I've been with for four years, it was it was amazing. I think that was the best part about it. Well, thank you so much, Courtney. Thank Job you. well done, well done. Now you guys are jumping around. I think we got Alicia next. Yeah. So freshman year, very successful, all freshman team in the American Athletic Conference. Now, you had a great summer in international play as well for the U19 team in Australia. Uh, as you look back at those memories for you, what did you learn uh, that will help you this season? Um, I think it's just obviously playing, playing games and then um, playing against like the best in the world. It's not like the best in a country, it's the best in the whole world. So obviously we were successful with that. We, got a, we won a bronze medal and we were all really proud of that. And I think playing over here really helps. Obviously, America is the number one team in the world for women's basketball. So playing in this type of game all year round almost and then being able to take that experience over to a world championship, I think that really helped us and was a part of our success. Well, you did play against the U.S., which you said, you said is the best in the world, and you dropped 20. So that, 
That not bad. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously playing against Americans for what six months or more really helps. So it was just a practice. Unfortunately, we didn't get to come up against Team USA in actual World Championships. But, but I don't know. Maybe if we did, it would have been different. But you know, we're moving forward. Hopefully, it gets better. Hey, take that twenty piece and you keep it in your back pocket. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Alicia. Great job. So, Fionda, great run for your team last season, all the way to the final four of the WNIT. No shortage of highlights from you hitting big shots. How do you think that experience, that deep run for your team, will help this year? Um, I think it was a great experience, and I think it gave our team a lot of confidence coming into this season. Um, it just showed us like that we're better than we we actually thought we were, or we compete with a lot. We can compete with a lot of good teams. I mean, everybody just has to do their part and give it their all, and hopefully, we can make a great run again this year. So, and every team is about making great memories. I remember my days as a player. You look back on those games and those moments that you never forget. In that run, what was the most memorable moment for you, and why? Um. <laughs> The most memorable moment was, I mean, just my team doing great, For honestly. I mean, I, I hit a couple big shots, but it was all for my team. Like, I just wanted to keep getting further in the, uh, in the tournament. So I did whatever I had to do to help my team win. Well, congratulations. We look forward to more excitement from your team this season. Thank you very much. Job well done. Tulane. Leslie Vorpal, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. Now, the Green Wave had its first NCAA tournament appearance in five years last season. Lots of success. Now, you lose some very important pieces, like Jamie Kaplan, some of your leadership. Um, what will be the most difficult thing to replace from last year's team? And then how will this year's team be even better? Yeah, um, I think over the summer, Coach has really just been working on um, underclassmen, now upperclassmen really just stepping up and taking those leadership positions because it's, it's like a sick, it's a one-to-one -one ratio with returners to, um, to newbies. So it's really everyone's the coach on the court. It's really just slowing everything down, paying attention to detail, telling, telling the girls, the new girls, where to be, um, explaining them, and just taking your time with it. You know, not, not being patient, knowing it's going to be a little slower at the start. But I think we have Colby Morgan. We have um, Courtney Latham. We have people that want to step up and um, – we all want to be successful. The freshmen are coming in, and they, they want it to have a big part, and they want to do whatever they can and learn however much they can to help us out. So I think it's going to be a good season. Now, obviously, we are hoping that there are more teams from the American in the NCAA tournament this upcoming season. But what was the NCAA tournament experience like for you? It was awesome. You know, um, I just remember the, the viewing of it was just so stressful because we were on that bubble, you know, and we were probably the last bracket to get picked. And, it was just a great experience, a great memory to have, awesome video to watch every now and then. It's just really motivating to just want to do it again and even set the bar even harder, not just making the tournament, you know, going into the next round, you know, going farther this year and knowing we can do it. We have the schedule for it. We, we have the players. We have the coaches, the leadership for it, and just knowing that we have it in, in ourselves to do it again. You absolutely do. Well, congratulations. We look forward to more excitement this year. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Kelsey Grovey. Uh, surprised a lot of people last year at Tulsa. Around this time, you were picked to finish ninth, and you finished third as a team. Uh, what was the key ingredient to you guys really, I guess, overachieving? Um, I think just coming in day in and day out in practice, uh, we knew that we were picked ninth, and we kind of used that as motivation. Um, we practiced really hard every every single day and um, I guess we kind of just wanted to prove people wrong. We had kind of had a chip on our shoulder. Um, wanted to show people that we could do better than I guess they thought. So, Well now that people are expecting or teams will be expecting the success and, and know what you are capable of in particular with your scoring, what kind of versatility have you added to your game or changed to catch people off guard this year? Yeah. Um, I think personally I practice, um, you know, preseason over the summer going off the dribble more. Um, uh, I normally shoot threes a lot, so going off the dribble, getting a mid-range jumper um, is what I personally added to the game. 
So. We know she can hit threes, right? <laughs> we are doing a lot of that last year. Thank you so much. Job well done once again by the student athletes. And you ladies can make your way back to the seats. That is the end of our third quarter. And now, unfortunately, it's our last quarter. It is the fourth quarter. And Leticia is going to bring up our coaches. All right. Last but not least is the fourth quarter. We're going to start off with USF. Jose Fernandez, please come to the stage. SMU, Rhonda Rampola. Temple, Tanya Cardoza. Tulane, Lisa Stockton. And Tulsa, Matilda Mossman. No pressure. Save the best for last, right? Maybe, yeah. Pressure <laughs> Well, your student athletes did a fantastic job. All right. So, Jose, we will start f with you. Um, obviously, as we mentioned, lots of success for your program last year. Congratulations. Um, successful summer. Took a foreign tour. Um, looking forward to an outstanding season again this year. But there's something that you're very passionate about because I follow you on Twitter, and that is recruiting. And so, for this audience, I just want you to share some of your thoughts on um, changes that we may need to see in women's college basketball as it pertains to the recruiting calendar, as it pertains to scouting services and things like that. What are some things you'd like to see changed? I don't know where to start. Uh, well, I tell you what, I, I think, and, and the coaches up here will agree with this, I like the change taking that fall evaluate, evaluation period away. I think uh, once school starts, uh, we got some clapping back there. You know, I, I think, you know, it's an opportunity for those kids to be with their schools and, their, and with their coaches. Um, the landscape of travel basketball and, and uh, shoe companies and, and the influences of, of scouting services has really, uh, I think, uh, changed our game from a recruiting standpoint. But uh, uh, for, for us, I think it's also changed the way that we've recruited. Um, uh, we've taken more of an international uh, presence in, um, in the student athletes that, 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 that uh, we've recruited in the last two, three classes. But, uh, I, uh, you know, next, next, uh, next April having two evaluation weekends, I don't know. We're going to see the same kids twice and after two weekends. I, don't, I didn't agree with that. Um, and... Uh, there's, there's a lot of things out there that we can do differently that, that, that we're doing right now. And how can we make recruiting more international friendly? You've had success in doing that, building those relationships and such. What more can we do to continue to open those doors and avenues uh, for international players? Well, it starts with the calendar, I think. If, if coaches want to attend any international events, um, whether it be world championships or or uh, FIBA America or FIBA Europe outside of the recruiting calendar, we should be able to attend those. I also think uh, we should be able to have the option to attend the USA trials as well. That uh, uh, um, if, you, if you're not involved with USA basketball, I think uh, you're at a disadvantage. And uh, uh, I think we're taking that, that approach. I know there's, there's, there's been legislation put forward and, and, and our conference stepped forward with, put, with uh, uh, approaching the WBCA, and we, we, we had ex, uh, extensive conversations about that in our spring meetings. Thank you, Coach. We appreciate your thoughts on that. Thank you so much. We will, we will record that and send that out for all uh, recommendations moving forward. So next we have Rhonda Rampola. How are you, Coach? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. So we're going to talk a little best practices. We may have some young coaches out here watching who want to get better. What are some things that you do to enhance and stay sharp on whether it's rules or new plays or how to best utilize practice times? What are some of the, the best practices for you that help you continue to grow as a coach? Well, for me, first of all, I'm, I'm a, a big film freak. I, I, I watch a lot of film and, you know, after, after last year, um, you know, kind of going back to, to a little bit our season last year, uh, I spent a lot of time this summer 
watching film and evaluating um, myself and, and what we can do differently. So I, I do think it's important for young coaches to understand how important it is to not just watch film of themselves, but also watch film of other programs and uh, because some of the best ideas are stolen ideas and, uh, and, and try and incorporate that to what you do. In, uh, in our practice right now, and, and we're getting into the thick of things in practice here, but I think it's important to have a lot of special situations. Uh, like, for instance, the other day in practice, uh, with one of the new rule changes, we were, we were in a scrimmage. And the, our guy, our male practice players, they were shooting a free throw. It was the fourth quarter. At the end of, it's like 58 seconds. I told our kids, I said, okay, let's call, uh, let's call a timeout when we get the rebound just to practice it. Well, I think four out of five of our kids knew what to do. The one person who didn't know what to do got the rebound, dribbled once, and called the timeout. And so, you know, it's interesting because even though you tell these kids, you read them the rules, uh, they listen to the officials, they really have to, they have to practice it. And I think practicing special situations is important. Um, you know, your kids are going to have to play through it this year with all the new rule changes, and I think coaches are going to have to coach through it a little bit. The other day in the scrimmage, I must have called four timeouts to stop, to stop the bleeding. Well, we're not going to be able to do that this year. So I think for us this year with all the new rule changes, just all the special situations in practice that, uh, that we've got to work on. And we talk a lot about mentoring and coaching and, and young coaches needing mentors and just every coach having maybe coaches they look up to or they've learned from. Who are some of your top mentors in the game? And, and maybe share a nugget of what you've learned. Well, it, you know, it's interesting because I've got, we're fortunate to have one of the best coaches uh, to coach a game right next door in Larry Brown. And I used to be real big on closed practices, not having anybody in our practice, not disturbing our players, uh, keeping their focus. Well, that man has coaches left and right coming in as, as practice, and of course I'm one of them. And you know, I like to go in there and, and watch and, and, and listen. But you know, I, I've come to learn that it's important to share your knowledge and, and let coaches come in and watch your practice, high school coaches and that. And so that's something that I've done in the last couple of years a little bit more is open our, our practices up to, to younger coaches and bringing their kids and just, just being able to share the knowledge that you have. Absolutely. It definitely helps to grow the game. One thing I saw this summer happen a lot because I cover the WNBA is we had a high number of college coaches coming in to watch WNBA practices because they're already in the quarter system. They already advanced the ball. So we saw an exchange of learning that I thought was very beneficial as we, as we transition here to women's college basketball. Thank you so much, Coach. All right. Tanya, how are you doing? Hello. <laughs> Again, congratulations on your run to the Final Four of the, of the NIT last year. Um, one thing that intrigues me about women's basketball right now is the high number of transfers. What can we do um, to lower that number? Um, you know, one of the things I think a lot of kids are committing early and not really doing their homework, um, so that sort of is a, a tough thing. but. I'm sort of fond of transfers. I actually like players to sit out and, and learn our system, um, give them a whole year of you know playing you know in a different environment. And I, I mean, we have three right now, actually four. So I'm I'm fond of it. Uh, I think it, it gives them a year to to think about the past and how they're actually gonna do better in this new system. Um, and I'm hoping that you know it pays off for us. You bring up a very good point. So it could be a new beginning where things maybe did not start off well or a second opportunity. For someone like me who may not understand that entire process, how does that happen with finding transfers and the opportunities? And is it equal out there in terms of what schools are able to, to gain? Um, I, I definitely think you can be wrong in, in picking up a transfer too. You definitely have to do your homework and um, making sure that it's the right fit and knowing that the kid who just transferred knows that it's their last go around. So they're definitely going to put everything in, into making sure that it's the right um, fit for them as well. Um, but just making sure that every single day that they're getting the most out of it and doing your homework early, honestly, I, I think that's the, probably the biggest thing is making sure that you know what type of kid you're bringing into your program and if they're going to be able to help you. 
Um, and there are a lot of kids that transfer for the right reason. You know what, this isn't the best situation for me. I need to find a better home. Maybe the first go around, it wasn't what I expected, but putting their all into the next go around. Thank you so much. Very hot topic in women's basketball right now. Good, bad transfers. Good discussion to have. Thank you so much. And Lisa, my fellow Demon Deacon, but we won't talk about that right now. You hit the 500 career win mark. Um, congratulations, last Thank you. season. Um, scheduling. Your team got an at-large bid to the NCAA tournament on that last bracket watching the selection show, yes. as Leslie reminded us of. Now that you've had to go around in the American Athletic Conference, how does this conference impact your scheduling and how do you go about best positioning your team um, for postseason opportunities? Well, I think scheduling is one of the most important things we do. Um, in the past uh, six, seven years, we, we look back, we've had six 20-win seasons. In, in uh, our previous conference, we scheduled very difficult in the preseason and we got in our conference and really just lacked the ability to, to be able to get that national recognition. And when we came to this league, the thing that we really hoped was that it would get us where we wanted to go. If, we, if you can't win the tournament, can you get an at-large bid? And I think the, the American Conference has brought us what we wanted, is that we were able to play a good schedule. And our, our players did a tremendous job of looking at the season as a journey. You know, it wasn't one game. We, we played Florida State early. They're, they're very good. They almost got to the Final Four. Um, they looked at that, and they took each game and looked at it as a journey. And at the end, sitting in that room waiting for your name to come up, I think they realized what the journey was about. They realized that they had done their work. They had really played a great schedule. They had, they had taken their beating at times. Um, but we were able to get see our name come up. And uh, I think it's, it's huge to what we do. And what has been, since making the NCAA tournament, how has that impacted your program and, and your off season and your recruiting and things like that? What have been the advantage of, of taking that next step in the postseason? Well, I, I think you've got to look at it as building off of something instead of starting over. I mean, we lost four talented seniors, but what has impressed me the most is our returners. I mean, they, they had that experience and they loved it. And they came in and, and they chose to stay all summer. We didn't make them stay all summer, but they took the freshmen under their wing. We have five freshmen. And uh, they've been tremendous leaders. And, uh, and the leadership they have shown, I think, is a direct reflection of the success they had that last year and what they want for our program. And they have been on those freshmen really hard to, to try to make them realize what the expectations are. So it definitely changes your mindset if your team accepts that role. And, and our team has done that very well. Thank you so much, Coach. And last but not least, Coach Mossman from Tulsa. So another change in women's basketball we're seeing uh, this year is the change in the format to the preliminary rounds of the NCAA tournament. We are returning to Saturday, Monday, Sunday, Tuesday. Um, what do you think of, of that change and how it will benefit the game? Well, I, I think looking back on how it used to be, I think it's a, it's a positive change. Um, the big thing is in those venues, we have to have people there. And, uh, you know, it's up to those communities to, to get the attendance up in those places. But I, I think it's a win-win. It's a and in looking at the game overall, since we're going to have you have the final say here, um, if you are having a conversation with someone who's maybe never watched the American Athletic Conference and its players and coaches, what would be your sales pitch as to why they should watch this league and this conference play this year? Well, the energy in the venues, you know, and the, uh, the respect of the coaches. You know, we've, we've, coaches in our league have, have, have uh, been around and have great, great reputations. And the, the student athletes in our league, they play with a lot of energy. There's a lot of talent. I look at the senior class in this room. Uh, we've got a great senior class uh, from school to school. Uh, you know, we're going to have some NBA draft picks or WNBA draft picks in that senior class. Um, I think if you're a student athlete looking at conferences, the American is going to wow you because of the athleticism, the style of play, the discipline of the teams, and, and how everybody goes about their business. Well, perfect note for us to end on. That is the end of the fourth quarter. Thank you so much, Coach. A lot to look forward to this year, from players to coaches who are so gracious to share their knowledge, all the excitement, games, conference staff. I know you guys have some things up your sleeves as well. I just want to say thank you um, for allowing me to be here and be a part of this once again. Barb, Siobhan, 
Mike, I appreciate the opportunity, and hopefully the rest of your media day will be a great one. Thank you so much for your time.